so here's where we get to my stuff. Corn roll. This is an insect pathogenic nematode. I worked with them on my PhD, trying to figure out how to get nematodes to do the dirty work of insecticides. This is before traded corn, when I was doing this research. I then did some of the pre-licensed work on the traded corn. I have opinions. Um, I used to go out with a hand, hands and knees and an undergraduate crew, syringe in hand, on the ground, squirt the nematodes at the base of every single corn plant. Because these nematodes, God love them, are stupid. And they don't know that they need sunscreen and they don't have it. Now, I got my sunscreen on. They don't have any. So when you put them on the soil, they do this. This is called nictating. They get 90% of their length up in the air and they wave. Well, they wave because they're sniffing. They're trying to find something that they can go live in. These are obligate insect parasites that contain bacteria that kill the insect. They have to get into the body of an insect to reproduce. So they're searching for that insect big enough for the get into. And if they're up doing that on the soil surface for more than 30 or 40 minutes, they fry. So we tried spraying them on, we tried squirting them on, we tried knifing them in at, at one study. And the best I could ever do, I finally got to the point where we just sprayed right at the base of the plant and let it run down in. That gave us some more water, some more moisture to help them. Because remember, nematodes swim. They don't have legs, they can't crawl. So we got to the point where I could use 100,000 nematodes per row foot, which is about $1,200 an acre at those prices. And I could just obliterate corn rootworms with that. I could stop corn rootworm feeding cold at second instar. Corn rootworms have three instars. The first instar, just when they hatch, they go after the tiny little peripheral roots of the early corn plant. If there are enough of them, that corn plant could even die. Second instars are still feeding out. Third instars, just before they pupate, get their big teeth, so to speak. You can see their feeding scars with your bare eye. They're about a millimeter across, as wide as their head. And they come in, and those are the ones that really take a root, a whole whirl of roots off. So I could stop these things cold before they did economic damage to corn with a natural enemy, well-timed. But I had to do it in a way that was cost prohibitive. Now this is where that part I said earlier about how my cornfield looked comes in. My soil looked like this. Every single year, it looked like this. It grew gorgeous corn, but the soil looked like this. Where are all the pathways for the nematodes to swim? Are there any? Unless there's a soil crack, we couldn't even get them in. Now, this is before soil health became a thing. This is in the, the late 80s, the early 90s, mid 90s. Wasn't a major concern. Interestingly, nobody on my committee, and that included the soil scientists, asked about tillage. So the question of doing this in a no-till environment never even came up. So I was asking nematodes that can't push the soil to go through this. I'm willing to bet that if I redid that study now, on a field that looked like this, that brown cottage cheese texture with lots of good pore space, good soil moisture because you're keeping the soil covered so it doesn't get so blasted hot. I bet you I could drop that rate of nematodes probably tenfold and get an effect. Now John asked me, other than just talking about insects, making insects great again, uh, to address a couple of things that might be of interest right now. 
I listened to a uh, webinar that Bruce Potter at Lamberton, a virtual field day, gave on the 11th. If you look, if you go to the uh, U of M uh, IPM blog, you should be able to find it. Um, he was talking about what they're seeing at Lamberton with corn rootworm. So as an old corn rootworm hand, I listened to this and I got, I got a creepy feeling. It was like, oh, it's happening again. Um, they are having in one of their fields 200 to 400 beetles a week on a single sticky trap. Now, a sticky trap is about the size of a piece of paper, bright yellow. I'm sure you guys know what they are. You fold them over. So when you're out in the field, you fold them over and you, you put them in a Ziploc bag and then you bring them back to the lab and you put them in a refrigerator. You never want to have one with 200 beetles on it. Because if you get it open even the next day, it is going to stink so badly that you're going to have to clear the room. If you don't get to it to the next week, it's going to be soup and you're going to be counting heads and trying to estimate that way. So they are having levels 200 to 400 beetles a week in their fields out there that they use for root one nurseries because obviously they're doing expe experiments with them. They need to keep that population going. But that's not unheard of for what's going on in parts of Minnesota this year. Populations, particularly of western corn rootworm, are high enough that traded corn is suffering economic level damage. So an entire whirl of roots may be gone on some traits. That means you've got yield loss on traded corn. People who are using treated seeds, so think of how many layers you've got here, of cost the treated seed, so it's got the neonic. That should protect it against things like seed corn maggot or wireworm early in the season, but isn't going to protect you against those big teeth rootworm larvae in late June. So that's there. Then you've got the cost of the trait, which in miles for those green silks. And the larvae feed on corn. And the females will lay their eggs in corn. Now, in Indiana and Illinois and Iowa and parts of Wisconsin, they have the soybean variant of western corn rootworm. The soybean variant of western corn rootworm has learned how to eat soybean leaves as an adult. Soybeans are not a host for the larvae. They can't survive on soybean roots. But the adults will eat the leaves. There are a few ladies here. Maybe a couple of us, other than me, have been pregnant. I have four sons, so I'm used to this idea. When you are pregnant, there comes a certain point where you cannot eat without feeling like you need to offload something. If you are a female beetle, when you eat, if you are full of eggs, you're going to go into that soil right there unless you are determined to get to that corn you're going to go into that soil right there and lay eggs. So the soybean variant of western corn rootworm will lay her eggs in a soybean field. If you then rotate back to corn the next year, they're waiting for you. If you are dealing with northern corn rootworm, which is native, that's the green one, to our part of the world, it's a prairie grass specialist. We brought corn to it. Northern corn rootworms already can get around rotation. Because if you think about it from the point of view of an animal in a prairie, you need to worry about prairie fire. If you have to hatch every year and grow every year, and there's been a fire, and that part of the prairie isn't growing, you're toast. So if part of your eggs can last two, three years before hatching, keep this one in mind. It's going to come up with the next thing I'll talk about. That is an advantage to you. Because then, if there's a bad grass year, you're fine. Your grasses come back, and, and your eggs hatch, and boom, you're in business. So northern corn rootworm, if those populations build up, and by the way, not just westerns are becoming immune to the traits. Populations of northern corn rootworm in North Dakota are now showing resistance as well. Uh, you need to think about three years. Let's get through the first year of the high population, knock it way down, put in another plant, not a corn rootworm host, knock it down, then maybe you go back to corn. 
That's that increasing diversity, but you're increasing it through time. Now, John also asked me to do a little research on soybean cyst nematode. <clears throat> Quite an education. <laughs> I don't work with soybean cyst nematodes, but found out some interesting things about them. And one is that soybean cyst nematode, like northern corn rootworm, can go for years without hatching. So nematodes have this ability to, they can wait for you to put their host plant back in the ground. I came across one article that quoted an eminent nematologist, which is somebody who studies nematodes, roundworms all the time, who said there's a really simple answer for uh, soybean cyst nematode, plant soybeans and then come back five years later and plant soybeans again. Now a five year rotation is probably not gonna work in most operations. So I saw a more updated recommendation, and that one was kind of, you know, tongue in cheek. Plant soybeans, then plant something not soybean, then come back and plant a different kind of soybean, one with more resistance if you're noticing soybean um, cyst nematode. And then if you plant soybeans again, another kind of soybean still. So that you're trying to confuse, confuddle, present an opportunity that they can't take advantage of. Because a soybean cyst nematode is in the soil waiting. It's in the soil as, and this as kind of gets to me, it's waiting in its mother's dead body. <laughs> That's what the soybean cyst is. The female is in the root. As she feeds, she gets enormous. Her back end pops out of the root. The male swims along and goes, ah, and fertilizes her. She makes eggs. The eggs stay in her body. So as the season progresses, some of those eggs may hatch and go through a life cycle within her body. And then when we get to the end of the season, they, she will die and the whole thing will become a resting state or a cyst nematode bomb, if you want to think about it that way, a little grenade. Now those don't move around on their own. Rootworms do, they don't. They have to be moved by soil. So if you keep your soil in one place, keep it covered, keep the wind from picking it up, keep the water from moving it, you're good. So does anybody have any questions? How am I doing on time? You, you, you're still good. I just wanted to give you a little good five, five you got a good five minutes. Got a good five minutes. Okay, then I'll tell you about two new things. One is a brand new insect to science last year, soybean gall midge. Uh, they too are taking advantage of the soil environment to overwinter. It's a tiny little fly. It lays its eggs as the soybean stem is naturally expanding and cracking. And then the larvae get in and they get just under the cuticle and they start eating the stem, they can kill the plant. We don't know what its natural enemies are yet. But some of that cool sampling where you just take stuff and, and sequence it indicates the presence of parasitic wasp DNA. So there may be micro wasps. And the wasps I'd be talking about would be about this thing. They need a home too. So we don't know who they are. We don't know what plants they're using. We don't know where they're living. But it's a safe statement that they must have been there. Or they would be able to take advantage of that environment. So they are using plants, probably using pollen, might be using soil. They need a home. They need that space. As we go through with the soybean gall midge, one of the things that we're going to have to learn is how to deal with it. Not necessarily how to manage it, how to deal with it, because it's all a numbers game. When you have an insect or, or something like a fungus that's taking advantage of your fields, it's how do you get the population down to the point where they won't. We know that soybean gall midges overwinter in the soil. We don't know the conditions that make that overwintering less attractive. And then the last one that I will mention, one that was just on the news the other day, certainly in the Twin Cities. We have a new beetle, a new beetle pest, the European chafer. Earlier I showed you a picture of a white grub. A chafer is a scarab beetle. 
So all of our white grubs are either scarab beetles or cicadas. Some people can't tell them apart uh, when they dig them up. So if it's a scarab beetle, then it's going to live in the soil as a larva eating roots. May not necessarily cause a problem. It's going to come up out of the ground as a beetle, fly around, eat, mate, lay eggs, start it all over again. The most recent introduction with which you all might be familiar of scarab beetle is the Japanese beetle. The Japanese beetle has turned into a phenomenal corn pest in parts of the country, not because of the damage it does when it's living in the soil, when it would be available for all the other things living in the soil to attack. It's when it's an adult, highly mobile, hard shell. The only thing that can take it out is either a great big dragonfly or a hungry bird. So you want to have dragonflies and birds to help you with these things. Uh, and they come along and they clip all the silks. So the new one, the European chafer, was discovered in St. Paul. <clears throat> Somebody had a totally ruined yard that all of a sudden erupted in half inch long green beetles. I mean brown beetles. Uh, little scare beetles about this big. Now for right now we know they're in St. Paul. Do I think that's the only place they are? No. Because the first time I saw a Japanese beetle in Minneapolis, I lived two blocks away from the park board's rose garden, and Japanese beetles love roses. It was 20 years before we knew they were a pest in the state. So things get here, they get established, they're in our soil environment, they're in our woods, they're in our our uh, grasslands and wetlands for years before we know they're here. Now we do. So as we have another source of protein for predators in the soil, we want to make sure that we're making our soil hospitable to those predators. Okay, does anybody have a question? Thank you very much.